Welcome to the Dean Speaker Series hosted by UNC Kenan Flagler and the Frank Hawkins Kenan Institute of Private Enterprise. I'm the Dean of the Business School, Doug Shackelford, and I'm thrilled to uh, have everyone join us today. The Dean Speaker Series is made possible through the generous support of the Archie K. Davis Endowment and was created to bring outstanding scholars and leaders from the field of business, education, and government to share thoughts and insights with UNC Kenan Flagler, the university and the community at large. Today's speaker is a true credit to this preeminent series and I'd be remiss for not acknowledging the efforts of the leaders of the Create Justice NC Coalition, in particular UNC's Melinda Maynard Lowry and Duke's Wesley Hogan for helping us connect with him. Darren Walker is president of the Ford Foundation a $13 billion international social justice philanthropy. Under his leadership, the Ford Foundation recently became the first nonprofit foundation in U.S. history to issue a $1 billion social bond in the U.S. taxable bond market to increase grant making to stabilize and strengthen nonprofit organizations in the wake of COVID-19. He's a member of New York's uh, Governor Cuomo's Reimagining New York Commission and co-chair of the NYC Census 2020. He also chaired the philanthropy committee that brought a resolution to the city of Detroit's historic bankruptcy. Before joining Ford, Darren was vice president at Rockefeller Foundation, overseeing global and domestic programs. In the 1990s, he was COO of Harlem's largest community development organization. Darren co-chairs New York City's mayoral Advisory Commission on City Art, Monuments and Markers, and has served on the Independent Commission of New York City Criminal Justice and Incarceration Reform and UN International Labor Organization Global Commission on the Future of Work. He co-founded both the U.S. Impact Investing Allowance and the President's Council on Disability Inclusion and Philanthropy. Darren is generous with his time, serving on a number of high-profile boards, including the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, the National Gallery of Art, Carnegie Hall, the High Line, the Committee to Protect Journalists, and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And just last summer, he was appointed to the boards of Square and Ralph Lauren. He's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and is a recipient of 16 honorary degrees, and university awards. Educated exclusively in public schools, Darren was a member of the first Head Start class in 1965 and, re and received BA, BS, and JD degrees from the University of Texas at Austin. He's been included on numerous leadership lists, Times Annual 100 Most Influential People, Rolling Stone's 25 People Shaping the Future, Fast Company's Most Creative People in Business, Ebony's Power 100 and Out Magazine's Power 50. Before we kick things off, I want to be sure to acknowledge the Ford Foundation as a generous supporter of UNC research for many years, having made $35 million plus uh, in grants and gifts to uh, Carolina, supporting a wide range of activities, including a number of projects through Keenan Flagler and the Keenan Institute. Darren, we are grateful for the support and especially for your time today. I hope all of you can join me in a warm virtual welcome to Darren Walker. Thank you very much, Doug Shackelford. It's a, it's a great honor uh, to receive uh, this invitation to be with you um, and to have this chance to engage. I'm a huge fan of uh, UNC and have learned so much through my affiliations uh, in the region, most recently uh, at uh, Duke, uh, where I was lucky enough to to be uh, the Terry Sanford uh, lecturer. And it was just um, an eye-opening and an enormously gratifying experience. So I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, well, it's great to have you. And uh, Darren, let's just start off with a little bit about your background. Uh, I know you uh, grew up in uh, from poverty in Louisiana, and uh, probably not a lot of people expect that the person leading the uh, uh, foundations of the magnitude that you've been associated with would have started in poverty in Louisiana. So your story is uh, an interesting one to begin with. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about your background? 
Well, I was born um, in a small town in a charity hospital in Louisiana, and uh, my uh, mother uh, took us actually out of um, that part of uh, the country, and we moved to East Texas to, to rural Liberty County um, in the early 60s. And uh, it was uh, there with some irony that we lived in Liberty County, the uh, county seat uh, was ironically called Liberty, but African Americans could not live in Liberty, Texas. Uh, we lived uh, in the next town over, which was uh, uh, the African American community. So I um, lived my until the third grade in uh, Ames, Texas, population one thousand two hundred, and uh, we we lived in a little shotgun house on a dirt road there. And one day in nineteen sixty five, a uh, a woman appeared on the road and she was talking to uh, the community about a new program that President Johnson was initiating that summer and enrolling um, the children. And I was lucky enough to be in that first class of Head Start in 1965. Uh, and very lucky uh, because I attended uh, public schools uh, and uh, a great public uh, university uh, and law school, uh, and all um, publicly financed. I was lucky to have scholarships, of course, but I, uh, Dean, always felt that um, my country was cheering me on. Mm -hmm. I always knew that in spite of my circumstances, uh, I felt like America wanted me to succeed. I never felt that there were uh, significant barriers to my advancement. Yes, I understood that there was real racism and I encountered it uh, uh, often, but uh, overall, I always felt that my country wanted me to succeed. And I always uh, knew that it was the public investments in human capital. We believed uh, in the potential of little boys and girls uh, who lived in shotgun shacks, uh, and uh, in uh, other parts of the country uh, who, who might be uh, low income, but um, we're not uh, uh, in, in, of poverty in our aspirations. And I, I, I am proud of the fact that I um, ha am the result of all of these public investments. And I proudly uh, assert uh, in many uh, fora that I am the uh, graduate of exclusive uh, uh, public education, because I want people to understand that. And when you're in these various places from Davos to Aspen to Sun Valley and, and, and the panel that you're on, I always make sure that, that when uh, the, the blurb about me is written, it says he is, a, he is a product of public education. And what I actually find is that in those places and spaces, that is, very unusual. In fact, I've never been on a panel in any of these places, uh, this sort of caravan of, 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 of elite travelers around the world where, where there's been anyone else who can say, I've never had a day of private education in my life. My entire education was publicly financed, publicly supported through public investment in the human capital, the human potential that lies in this country. We are not short of talent. Talent is spread evenly across America. Opportunity is not. And what I worry about today, Dean, is that young children, little boys and girls uh, living on dirt roads, living in housing projects, uh, living in uh, rural uh, communities, don't feel that America is cheering them on, that the country wants them to succeed and that the barriers to their success uh, are few. You, you might imagine, Darren, at, at uh, being part of the nation's first public university, those words resonate a great deal with us. Uh, um, so let me ask you about that, because I think you and I are probably of the same era and, um, and what, what has happened during our lifetime that you would go from saying you feel like the country was pulling for you, that they were supporting you as you when you were a small child, 
to now feeling like um, if uh, if it was 50 years ago or 60 years ago uh, today, and you were one of those small children in the same place you grew up, if you wouldn't feel like the country's going for you. Well, I think we should start with education and access to excellent, affordable education. <clears throat> I always knew that uh, I would be able to be educated, go to college, uh, and that the cost was really not a barrier. Uh, yes, um, we didn't, my mother didn't have the money, but I, I did not, I never believed that I wouldn't be able to go to college because it was not affordable. I think today that is not the case. Uh, there are many people who think twice about college or make choices about college based solely on, um, on cost. And I didn't, when I therefore graduated, uh, I didn't have debt. Uh, so when I encounter so many of the young people uh, we have at the Ford Foundation and in other uh, places uh, who tell me the stories of six-figure debt. Um, it's hard to imagine how those young people can think about, dream about starting a small business, uh, how they can uh, begin to save uh, to buy uh, an apartment, or the kinds of things that I was able to do um, simply because when I, when I arrived in New York City, uh, I, again, I didn't have uh, uh, college debt. I didn't have law school debt in that way. So I think that's a major thing that has changed, and that is affordability and and access. Uh, and I just think the the, the environment has changed, uh, and I think inequality is driving uh, much of the challenge of of what what we see in our society today. We are a nation with hope at the center of the American narrative. Hope is the oxygen of democracy. And yet inequality asphyxiates hope because it makes people, particularly people who are not advantaged, feel that the systems that are supposed to serve them are actually rigged. They're rigged for privileged people like me. Uh, and other people who have are lucky enough to have high income, have amassed uh, real estate assets, whatever you want to, uh, because we uh, have done incredibly well. And what we know is that most Americans have not done incredibly well. Most Americans, and certainly the average worker, we know from the independent research, some of it done at your university, that demonstrates that wages have been stagnant for two decades for the average worker, while people like myself, um, who have been fortunate enough to be invested in the stock market or to uh, own real estate in Manhattan, um, we have, have benefited enormously, uh, even in a pandemic, uh, to see just, just open your quarterly statement from your broker, and, and just to see, for those of us who have been lucky enough to just be in index funds in the market, um, it, it's, it's, it is shocking. And there is something problematic about this. You know, I, I, I can relate with uh, some of what you were talking about there. When you were at University of Texas, I was here at UNC as an undergraduate. And uh, I tell every, all of our alums, if you were a student here before 2000, you came on a free ride. We just probably didn't tell you that but it was so cheap. Um, it was so easy to get an education. I, I left here with more money than I came because I had a couple of jobs. And um, so I, I got a free education. And uh, from that, that day, basically the entire world was opened up as an opportunity for me. Um, yet, let me ask you, um, in your role now with the Ford Foundation, I know some of the things you're doing, I probably don't know many of them, what are you guys doing to try to address these issues that you're you're talking about right now of inequality and um, and in some sense the haves um, and the have-nots? Well, I think one thing that we support uh, is research and evidence about what is happening around uh, work, 
technology, um, the economy writ large that either contributes to or inhibits opportunity and demonstrates uh, the manifestations of inequality. Um, and, you know, this is uh, a, a business school and uh, a, an institute that I know was founded on the great uh, resources, the, with the great resources of um, the Kenans. And that was capitalism, just like the Fords, just like the Rockefellers, just like um, the Morgans and the Fricks and all of the great names um, like Kenan, who were philanthropists as well. And so the great bounty of, of Mr. Kenan's wealth was put into philanthropy. Um, but capitalism uh, is not in a good place, I believe, in this country today. As a proud capitalist, I believe that there is no better way to organize an economy than capitalism. But the kind of capitalism we have today is not delivering on its potential. In fact, I would assert that we have actually, in America, never given capitalism a chance. Capitalism mm -hmm. has actually never been fully practiced in America. Although we have told ourselves of a narrative that we are a nation uh, where capitalism has flourished and because of that free enterprise, et cetera, mm -hmm. and that narrative. But if you look over our history, in the 19th century, um, Capitalism and an economy based on enslaved labor, that's not capitalism. I mean, this is in the great uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda's Hamilton in the, that amazing scene of the cabinet meeting when Hamilton and Jefferson are going at it and Hamilton is making the case for a national bank. You saw it and Jefferson is telling him, you know, uh, Mr. Hamilton, we Southerners don't believe in this idea you're propagating of this national bank. We Southerners, we don't believe in all of this debt that you're trying to build a nation on. And of course, Hamilton's retort was, Jefferson, quit your ranting. We know who's doing the planting. What Hamilton was saying was, well, of course you don't need debt because you don't pay people for labor. That's not capitalism. It wasn't capitalism in the 20th century to take large swaths of the geography of America and certainly in our cities and draw red lines around them and the government and financial institutions agree to collude to keep capital from those places while it privileged capital flowing into new suburban, primarily white communities. It wasn't capitalism. Redlining, uh, Adam Smith did not believe in redlining. And, um, and capitalism didn't flourish in those communities in part because of it. And the legacy of that remains with us today. So I actually would like to give capitalism a chance, um, but it's not delivering on its promise because we have, um, I think, gotten the allocation of capital to labor, it's, it, is, it is out of whack. I mean, we really need to uh, rethink <clears throat> this question of the future, not only the future of work, but the future of workers. Because ultimately, this all has bad implications for our politics. Uh, the inequality that we're seeing today is creating the first generation of downwardly mobile white people. We have never had a generation. Yes, during the depression, there was a period, but we have never had a generation downwardly mobile. This is very bad for our politics. Um, and of course, this is converging with the reality of the historic discrimination and marginalization from the mainstream American economy of African-Americans, especially, and, and other communities. 
So we have work to do. And at the Ford Foundation, what we are trying to do is to support those organizations who are generating the research, generating the policy ideas, doing the advocacy work to educate the public about the reality of our situation, and hopefully bringing voice to some of these ideas and communities who have been left out and left behind and who we have to include in the American dream in the future if we are to sustain ourselves as a nation. Let me ask you uh, a question. Uh, if you were the dean of a leading business school, what would you do to make those things you're talking about more of a reality? I think as, the, as a leading business school in the country, uh, business schools have been challenged because business schools have contributed. Business schools have been imbued with an ideology that Milton Friedman, I think, was uh, partially responsible to in his uh, famous essay 50 years ago, uh, in which he said that the business, the social responsibility of business is profit. And um, while I don't want to vilify Friedman, Friedman put forth the, the, the intellectual architecture that a lot of other things then got hung on to. Um, and, and a lot of things that, uh, and ideologies and points of view, not only about shareholder primacy and, and, and really jettisoning, jettisoning the idea of stakeholders mm -hmm. and, and simply saying the focus needs to be shareholders. Uh, that idea uh, has influenced generations of business leaders and it has influenced, uh, along with other streams of thinking like Ayn Rand, who I also think was integrated into this at some point. When I was growing up, um, you know, I, I liked reading Whitman and 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 Rousseau. I mean, I, I didn't read uh, Ayn Rand very much, but once I actually did, I found it extremely disturbing. Yes, I understand. The, the notion of, of the individual and nonconformity uh, in the face of, of bureaucracy and these things. But on the other hand, the ideology that is em, em, embraced, I mean, this was a woman who said that altruism was a disease. I mean, I mean, and you know, I, and I have seen many CEOs, many leaders in government lift her up as, uh, as, as, as a philosopher of our time. Mm -hmm. um, all of this has contributed to, I think, a sense of a, uh, of a uh, lessening of a commitment to the collective, uh, to the uh, work that we have to do as a nation and the role that business plays in that work and the role that business leaders play in that work. And so I think business schools need to be imbued not only with a sense of freedmen, with a sense of King um, and with a sense of Gandhi and, and that all of this needs to be a part of the curricula. And yes, you, you need statistics, you need marketing or whatever, the, but at the end of the day, if people leave and do not possess a level of empathy, a level of compassion, uh, an ability to see uh, and put themselves in the shoes of other people uh, and feel that their real focus is particularly if they're going to manage a private, a, a public uh, entity has to be EPS and, and, and EBITDA and, and, and what the multiple is that you can sell for. All of those things matter. Absolutely. You've got to keep your eyes on those things, but we have, we have fomented a system now uh, that has all these strands have come together in, and it, it, we know it's not working. Actually, we know it's not working. I mean, I shouldn't say that. It's working for us, just to be clear. Mm -hmm. The system, you know, the last few years for Darren Walker financially, personally, have been nothing short of 
amazing because all of the system works to my advantage. The tax policies, the way capital, I mean, works to the advantage. So if I were simply here talking about, you know, Darren Walker personally, my own personal situation, I'd be like, can we just leave things alone? <laughs> this is really working for me. But while I know it's working for me, it's not working for my country and it's not sustainable. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, let me ask you, you know, it was, I think it was about a year ago, the Business Roundtable uh, came out with, uh, in some sense, their form of rejecting um, Friedman and uh, shareholder chemistry and, and started talking about share, stake, stakeholder uh, primacy and this uh, broader set of objectives. Um, what sort of um, promise do you give to that? Do you think that uh, large, the largest businesses in the company, country, do, do you think that they can lead a reform of these issues you're talking about? I certainly believe that there is a commitment to uh, move away from a narrowly defined uh, shareholder uh, primacy idea. And I was peripherally involved just in sort of the consultative process of that. And I know that Alex Gorski at at J&J and, &J and Jamie Dimon and Doug McMillan and, and others who were involved in that, um, who I was in touch with during that period were working hard to, to re-articulate something that did move away from the narrow. And so I think uh, it was a good move. I think what those uh, CEOs are up against is a larger system. I'm sorry to keep coming back, uh, Dean, to this idea of the system, but sure. we have systems and structures that define, that establish the rules of the game, et cetera, and, and those systems. So the system for a public company CEO is a system where every quarter they have earnings calls and um, on those earnings calls, there's not a whole lot of conversation about anything other than how to model EPS <laughs> and how to understand the financial and capital structure of the company um, and how to understand whether or not the guidance that is being given is going to be achieved or not or whatever. Right. Yeah. So that so we need the we need the analysts, the ways in which um, the the gatekeepers and those who are assessing uh, the value of the companies to understand and value stakeholders, yeah. right? And I know that it is harder because it is not as easily quantifiable uh, when you move beyond simply the balance sheet. But there are, as you know well, a, a, around it's anything. Let's just start with um, the, the environment. I mean, there are material implications for the balance sheet that that many say um, is not fully uh, accounted for in the balance sheet. And so those conversations need to be had um, and conversations around um, the other parts of the uh, ESG uh, need to be more fully uh, uh, embedded. Uh, and, and so this, the, the incentives uh, the way in which uh, CEOs get judged have a lot to do with their ability to be able to move more towards this idea of, of, of stakeholder uh, uh, capitalism, inclusive capitalism, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. You know, I, I totally agree with you about it being a system. I, um, I grew up in a farming community. And when I go in the grocery store and look at the prices of food, I don't see how a farmer can survive. Um, now, I'm just like you. I've benefited from this system, and I don't go in and say, "Well, can I pay twice as much for, uh, you know, my vegetables, or my fruit, or my beef?" Um, uh, because I get my food at, a, at a, you know, the percentage of the American uh, cost of living that goes to food is a, is a fraction of what it was a generation or two or three or four generations ago. But that whole system just winds it down where. The farmer or the farm worker, there's there's a pittance left over because Absolutely. because you and I can eat like 
kings used to eat for, yeah. for pennies. Um, it's, uh, or if we want to eat extravagantly, we can do that too. Exactly right. Uh, again, at what used to be a, a substantive level of, of cost, uh, you know, uh, in, in the past where maybe a third or half your income would have just gone for food and clothing. Uh, and the same thing with clothing, you know, the, the price of so many things has been driven so far down because the, the profit margins downstream are just minute. Um, well, Darren, I've been doing a lot of yapping. Um, my my board here is getting packed with questions. Oh, <laughs> which okay. Is, which you think is is great because it's just a reflection of how much the audience is uh, interested in your thoughts. Let me throw one out there: um, student loan forgiveness. What do you think about that? Are you for that or not? Well, I absolutely believe that we have to uh, remediate, uh, redress uh, the situation uh, of in the aggregate college debt um, and the burden it uh, places uh, on young people today. And so I believe uh, specifically that whether it is through uh, some form of debt forgiveness or a form of um, uh, a uh, correlating payment with with a, a career choice, um, th there has to be the status quo is not acceptable. I also have not appreciated the growth of the private financing system, which profits off of what ought to be a public good, right? So I am a capitalist, but I actually believe that higher education should primarily be financed through the public system. And I don't, I mean, and this is one of the reasons young people at record numbers are cynical about capitalism, right? So I'm sure you have seen the Pew uh, results. Uh, we have people under the age of 34, over 50% of people surveyed in that age category, had a negative view of capitalism. Yeah, yeah. That should worry people like me and you. I mean, that, <laughs> that should worry. Because, but we understand why they have a negative view because their knowledge of capitalism in part is that they have a student loan from a private usurious bank or, or some form of, 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 of debt um, that's been privately financed. It's that they learned about the private prison system that companies that are publicly owned with shareholders actually um, hope that there are people going to prison so that profits can be made. I mean, these this is how for young people, they see, many of them see, increasingly see capitalism manifest and as opposed to it being manifest in, you have a chance to start a small business. You have a chance to actually begin to save for a home and build equity. Well, they, they're not doing that because they don't have the income to do that because they're burdened by debt. Let me ask you another question here. Someone wrote, are you satisfied with the current impact of philanthropy? Not necessarily just talking about your foundation, but just in general, the impact of philanthropy on these issues we're talking about. No, I'm not, including my own institution, which needs to do better. So philanthropy uh, has been, is rooted in, in some ways, certainly modern American philanthropy in a philosophy that was first really espoused by Andrew Carnegie in his famous 1889 essay, The Gospel of Wealth, in which he outlined uh, a framework uh, of giving um, for wealthy men like himself and Rockefeller and Frick uh, and the others. And that idea has really uh, of charity, of generosity, uh, has undergirded uh, American philanthropy. And uh, I actually, while I am a believer in and in, in, in see the value in what Carnegie articulated, Carnegie was not concerned about inequality. Um, it, Carnegie didn't challenge uh, the fact that the Carnegie libraries that were built across America 
were segregated and that in fact, the black Carnegie libraries uh, were not of the quality uh, that the white Carnegie libraries were. And uh, these things, while he understood them, he thought the issues were just normative. Uh, in 1968, Martin Luther King wrote uh, a, a short essay on philanthropy and he said the following, philanthropy is commendable, but it should not allow the philanthropist to overlook the economic injustice which makes philanthropy necessary. And so what King was saying was that as a giver, as a philanthropist, you need to ask yourself some questions, not simply to say, oh, let's give money to build or support homelessness, but ask yourself, why is there so much homelessness? Uh, ask yourself, not just let's help alleviate poverty by giving to this school, but why are so many children only getting a decent meal, a healthy meal at school? So, so what, what King admonished was we have to move philanthropy from generosity and charity to dignity and justice. And in order to do that, the philanthropist has to get, as John Lewis, our great congressman would say, get uncomfortable. But for, we're, not, we're not about getting uncomfortable. The whole point of being <laughs> wealthy is to be insulated from being uncomfortable. And, and the whole point of privilege is to not have to deal with uh, discomfort. And I think that's the rub for philanthropists today. Uh, is that um, we continue to not be willing to fully embrace Dr. King's admonition. We we aren't fully willing to uh, to engage because we think, especially a lot of new younger philanthropists, that you know, look, I'm a billionaire. I've made billions, and I'm 50 years old. America's a good place. It's a fair country. I started with nothing. I mean, I've heard so many narratives like this. And so to get that philanthropist to actually admit or to excavate and really engage in what is unfair in the systems, not yeah. anecdote about a school or a neighborhood, but the structures. So not just, oh, we need to help returning uh, uh, formerly incarcerated people get jobs, but why are so many black and brown people locked up in the first place? Like let's let's engage in that discourse and and understand that we actually have created a system that is designed to lock up disproportionately black and brown Americans and poor white Americans too, right? That we have a system, and so when we look sort of downstream and want to help ameliorate something, um, that often makes us feel good. We feel good when, you know, it's Christmas and you're walking into Bloomingdale's and you put money in the, you feel good because we know from the research that, that, that this, the brain reacts to that and you get a rush from that, which is why we all, you know, when you give money, you, you get, you feel really good about yourself. What Dr. King was saying is don't be so quick to feel good about yourself. Um, and, and that's where I think we, and, and including my own institution, have to do a better job of engaging. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got a question here with someone saying, will wealth tax or tax on wealth, would that help with these systematic issues you're, address, you're, you're raising? Well, let's just be clear. We have a problem of a tax policy uh, that is not progressive, uh, that is too regressive. So I don't want to opine on any particular proposal, but I will say in my view, and the view of many um, economists, uh, we have a system that relies too heavily uh, on 
uh, a few people at the top and taxing uh, working class people, especially um, for all sorts of things. And I, I say this because I, I I see places where people say, "Well, we don't have a we don't have a state tax." Okay, you don't have a state tax, but everything else in your state is taxed at a crazy rate. I mean, you know, everything from a fishing license to your driver's license, uh, the actual cost of that uh, is another form of a tax because you don't want to ideologically say we have a tax. So everything else gets. And I think again, it is it is, it is allowed for this this reduction of investment in public goods. So I actually absolutely believe that we have a system that needs to be reformed. Uh, we have a tax system that needs, that is desperately in need of reform so that uh, we can both generate the, the resources we need to invest in infrastructure, in education, especially higher education and early childhood education. I, I believe firmly that we need to reform our system. Got a question here in which someone says, uh, the, the topic of diversity, equity, inclusion is going on everywhere these days. Uh, how do we get beyond people talking and, and actually being true to their word and not just paying lip service to this topic? Well, I think this question uh, is a question I consistently here in different fora, because I believe that uh, in the wake of the murders of 2019, we saw uh, some remarkable uh, performances. I mean, I, I, I don't know what else to call some of what we saw uh, by leaders um, who acknowledged uh, for the first time publicly uh, systemic racism as a challenge uh, who uh, actually uh, wrote and said the words, Black Lives Matter. Um, and I think the question and, and the uh, skepticism is that these were just that, performances. Uh, and whether there will be follow through is, is up for, uh, I think, a debate. I think we will know uh, when we see those leaders, those companies, those universities, those institutions actually make commitments, make commitments to move from, uh, in some cases, tokenism to transformation. So I just will start with something I've been engaged in, um, the boardroom and the C-suite, where uh, many corporations found themselves last year without the capability, uh, without the internal intelligence to navigate uh, what we were uh, seeing, um, both within the companies and out, outside uh, in, in the streets. And I think that is a reflection of the fact that there was uh, so uh, little diversity in so many places, right? That, that the number of S&P 500 that did not have an African-American, the number of NASDAQ listed companies, uh, that it, it was shocking, uh, absolutely shocking. And it showed because um, the, those leaders, and I know because I spoke to many of them, uh, those leaders were without uh, internally uh, the levers to help them get through this. And, and so people were doing, in my view, sometimes not even the smart thing because they just were uh, you know, shooting and throwing things at the at the at the wall just to get something on the board. Uh, and I think we are going to know a year from now. Uh, there will be uh, next summer. We'll we'll see the media return to this. What's happened in the last year? I am certain the media is going to, and I'm certain within companies we have structures that we didn't have ten years ago. Uh, the power of the employee resource groups uh, within many of the large companies uh, is significant. Uh, I have talked to any number of, of ERGs at companies uh, where I've been invited by the CEO to come and speak and on the three boards uh, where, where I'm a, a director. Um, and those employees uh, have 
uh, have influence. I mean, the, the CEOs uh, are listening and, and, and they know um, that, that that internal stakeholder group uh, is going to be back a year from now and want to know what progress has been made. I think externally uh, there will be pressure. So I don't think it's going to be like in the past, Dean Shackelford, that people could simply say, you know, make some grants to uh, some black organizations, uh, do some performative acts, you know, send out a, a video apologizing or saying the company's going to do better or whatever. And then let's go back to business as normal. That's not going to, that playbook will not work uh, this time. And I think smart leaders know that. And not only because uh, it, it's strategically, it's it, they know it because it's the right thing to do. They know that they need to hold themselves accountable, uh, not because they don't want bad PR, but because they know that their companies, by being more diverse, will be more productive, will be more profitable, will have higher levels of employee satisfaction. These are all the manifestations of diversity. We've got a question here about affordable housing. Um, thoughts on that, and how do we uh, how do we address that? Well, I think this is, you know, when I look at our work. Uh, at Ford across the country, uh, this is one of the most critical issues because we all know the role of housing in providing a platform uh, for access, access to schools, access to transportation, access to jobs. Um, and yet we also know that uh, housing, affordable housing, workforce housing uh, is uh, not being built at any, well, at any significant level anywhere in America. It's just not being built. And the reason it's not being built, two, two core reasons. One, it needs some form of policy to support it. And the financing of it is hard without subsidy or without some form of cross subsidy, right? I mean, and so, so let's just take the places with the highest uh, inaffordability, right? So let's just take a place like Silicon Valley. So the policy of anti-density is in large part why they have a crisis because they refuse in those communities to do any rezoning that would allow for more density because they want to preserve the privilege of the, of, and I understand that. But until we are able to address those core barriers, and I, you know, I spoke at a dinner that Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan invited me to at their home to talk about, because they are very interested in this issue and Facebook and CZI, their philanthropy is given hundreds of millions to this issue. But my message to them that evening was, this is not going to work. I mean, you can get billions, but if you can't build anywhere close to where people work, so if you're going to have to build on the other side of, of the bay, so people have a two-hour commute if they're coming into Facebook, I'm not really sure that's a successful affordable housing strategy. A more successful affordable housing strategy would be to figure out how you can create more density and manage that density, that needs to be the priority, right? But again, people don't want that, right? So the nimbyism uh, that we see is a huge problem. And, you know, I, I know my beloved New York City has lots of uh, challenges, but one of the things I actually am proud of is that we do have uh, diverse housing. I mean, you can live, you know, as I do in a, in a particular part of the east side and a few blocks away is a public housing project. And, and that's the way it ought to be. Um, and we need to have more mechanisms that allow for housing construction um, and for preservation of affordable housing. And that is going to require policy change. And again, do we have the will? Um, that's the question. 
because there are solutions. It's not a, the challenge here is that you know um, th- this is not this is not an area that for which there is not a solution. I mean, this there are many solutions. It's just that we have not exerted the will and mobilized public support to do the work. You mentioned New York. Um, New York and Michigan University have always had a tight relationship. We've got lots of alums there, and we draw sure of, and, and we draw a lot of students from uh, from the city and the surrounding area. Um, talk to me a little bit about what COVID has done to the city, and and where do you see the city on the other side of COVID? Um, uh, do you think New York will be what New York has always been, or do you think New York is uh, going to be uh, in some sense changed forever? Well, I certainly think, you know, where you started, uh, I think you do find an affinity for UNC in this city. I mean, there, and part of it is because there are so many alum, but also part of it is because UNC is seen as uh, an attractive, selective university. uh, And so you attract very talented uh, young people from New York uh, to to attend UNC, and and I think that uh, kind of uh, circularity um, only builds on itself, and it's why you know uh, some of the people who I know uh, who are UNC alums or are, are, are Southerners who moved to New York, and then uh, increasingly I find younger people who are from New York who went to UNC and came back to New York, right. um, and so and so we see uh, that here. I think the question of New York's future is something that I uh, am am very focused on. And in part, you mentioned uh, the governor's commission, but uh, also uh, the work here of uh, of a number of, of, of policy uh, groups that, that, that we're involved in supporting uh, is uh, seeking to understand uh, what uh, the demographics are going to look like uh, and, and how to to develop the kind of predictive modeling uh, around that. Uh, there is no doubt that there will be a period of disruption. Uh, there's no doubt that we are going to see a changed city. Uh, I don't uh, believe that that change will be uh, a more diminished city. I mean, the amazing thing about New York is that uh, it is uh, among the most resilient cities in the world. And the degree to which, I mean, even just the restaurant situation, the fact that within weeks of COVID, you and shutdown of 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 the of restaurants, restaurateurs have come up with a way to build platforms on the street, uh, connect electricity, and and have now an amazing street life. I mean, so what's what's interesting is it's the middle of winter. Um, I, uh, I'm, I dine out outside, um, uh, often and in the middle of winter, uh, I was, you know, earlier this week, it was cold. People were in individual areas, uh, with friends or family, with the heat lamp, with blankets, but people were outside on the street. Um, uh, this is a city that is, you know, just enormously, uh, uh, creative and 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 the ingenuity and entrepreneurship that exists here, I think, will sustain the city. But there is no doubt that it is going to be uh, there is going to be some pain. What I worry about is um, is the fallout uh, on essential workers, on the people who uh, weren't lucky enough to be able to 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 escape to the Hamptons or to the Hudson Valley. Uh, and and sit out um, uh, COVID. Uh, the families who uh, are one paycheck away from eviction. Uh, that's the population I worry about. Um, obviously, it concerns me when I hear, you know, very wealthy people who, um, you know, are complaining about the con- you know the concern about taxes. And I understand um, the concern about taxes, but my focus is less on taxes and and more on people. And I understand that there is a connection, but um, at the end of the day, uh, we can't starve the city. Um, At the end of the day, one of the problems, one of the consequences of inequality is that 
more people rely on taxes paid by fewer rich people. I mean, I think that's, you know, I, I've heard wealthy people sort of say, you know, we're the ones paying, you know, a, a, for such a large part of the public uh, uh, revenue. Well, that's true. And that's not good, actually. You know, I mean, because so much has been amassed by a few of us, we are paying. So yes, it's true when people when when I hear wealthy people say, "Well, don't come, don't criticize us. We're the ones paying." Uh, well, yeah, we should be paying because we are the ones who have amassed the most. And so it's an interesting uh, dialogue when when on the one hand I hear people make those kinds of statements uh, defensively or or as if or as if to say, you know, you should be thanking us. Um, Actually, we should be paying. People like me, people, we should be paying. Uh, but I would actually like to have a more balanced economy where people didn't have to depend on EITC, a government subsidy, to be able to supplement their wages because their wages are so low that without a government subsidy, they're in poverty. And so they're not able to pay taxes because their wages are so low. Yeah. You know, I, I think you're you're so right about we've we've recognized this inequality gap for a long time, but COVID has just swelled it and and really highlighted it because you're right. Uh if 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 your entire wealth is tied up in the stock market, it's been a well of a 12 months. If your entire life is tied up in going to work every day and having to battle um, with the fact that interaction with people can get you sick, it's been a hellacious 12 months. And, um, and you don't really get a choice about which of those two camps you find yourself in. Um, but the two have diverged in ways that are remarkable, even in light of the inequality we face going into this. Um, Darren, if, if I tried to uh, ask you all these questions, we'd probably be here till midnight. And a number of people have written on here and just said, thank you so much for the insightful uh, comment you've made. And, and, and I'm sure the thought-provoking things that you have uh, addressed will reverberate here our community, community for quite a while. Um, I am so appreciative of you taking time out from the many responsibilities you've got to join us today. So on behalf of the entire uh, Kingdom Flagler community and, and Chapel Hill and UNC, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, for the rest of you, uh, please mark your calendars. Our next Dean speaker will be Michelle Buck. Um, Michelle is one of our alums, and she's also Hershey's chairman of the board, president and CEO, and she will be joining us virtually on April 8th. Um, we might ask her some of these uh, challenging questions that uh, Darren's raised uh, because of the role that she plays at, um, at Herky. You can register for that event and upcoming Dean Speaker Series events by visiting uh, keenaninstitute.unc.edu backslash events. Thanks to everyone. I hope you have a wonderful uh, afternoon. Um, take care, be safe, be kind, and be compassionate.